Okay, we're holding in the third peric of Kohelet. We gave a little bit of an introduction last week about very important concepts that are basic to Judaism. And the more we're familiar with these concepts, the easier it will be for us to understand what Kohelet is talking about. Tonight, we will focus on one of those concepts, and that is Masal. So before we go on to reading all of chapter 3, we will begin with Mazal because that's what he pretty much is implying when he talks about that everything has a time. And we, just, we already spoke a little bit about what this concept time is, but there's a lot more depth to it. What does it mean that everything has a time? In other words, it, it seems to imply that there is a reason for everything, that everything is perhaps uh, predestined, or, it, or is it predestined? In other words, can there be something that's predestined? Or is just everything random? So we've covered a, uh, a little bit the topic of free will versus predestination in the past. But in, ta in talking about Mazal, we will be touching a little bit on these issues as well. It's very important that we look around that we think a little bit about what we see, what we observe at all times. And that's something that people don't do enough. And analyze what is, it, what is this world all about. The Jewish people has an advantage. We have an advantage that we have a lot of this information written down for us. A lot of what there is in this world has been documented. Some of it is in the Zohar, other in the Talmud, in the Midrashim. So there's, of course, a lot for us to learn from these sources. But even without these sources, one can tell a great deal by observing. And what do we see when we look around? We have to agree, I think we all agree, that you see a very organized world. There's a certain seder. There appears to be a certain organization in the way things function. The world, this world functions. There appears to be a tochnit, a plan. There appears to be some sort of design, some degree of design. There's a lot of beauty. There is structure. There is symmetry. We even see a lot of colors, which enhances, of course, the beauty, which makes it even more interesting. All of this, when we look at it together as a whole, appears to indicate, in the strongest terms possible, that there's someone behind it who put it together. Things interact in a very unique way. There's a certain dependency in the animal kingdom. Just everything appears to be operating well, until, of course, man gets involved where he's capable of destroying. But there seems to be a certain balance. There seems to be a structure. All of this is, all of this is observable to the naked eye. What is not seen and what is not easily observable is the to'altiyut, the benefit of everything there is in this world. Even David HaMelech was puzzled, why did God create a spider? Who needs a spider? Save his life. <laughs> he was even asking about those who have a pigur sikhli, those who have retardation, mentally retarded people. Is there a need for these type of individuals in the world? Why would God create somebody like that? with certain disabilities. So the, it's not always evident to us the toilet, the benefit of something. Up to this very day, they don't really know what the benefit or what the use or purpose is of the appendix. So here we see a human body. We see that there is a need for just about everything that is in this human body. I don't think people want to give up their kidney, right? But it's not immediately, it's not immediately known what the benefit, what the toilet of everything that we see. That it is designed, that it serves some purpose, it is more apparent. But what that purpose is, what is the benefit of that particular creation, we don't always see immediately. Neither do we see the internal mechanics. We see the outer structure. We spoke about things having a structure, yes. But the internal mechanics, up until the time they, the, they discovered the ability to see cells, I mean, once upon a time you couldn't see a cell, 
today with the powerful microscopes, you can see the internal structure of everything. The blood and the white cells, the, the red blood cells and the white blood cells, the platelets. I mean, all of these things I, I, I call internal structure, components that are not easily visible. But if you are given the right kelim, if you're given the, if you possess the right instruments, with time, you may be able to see and understand a little bit better what these things are for, the inner workings of much of what we see and what we have in creation. Afterwards, if you observe a little bit more and you learn a little bit more, you will come to see that not only is there order and design in everything, but there are also rules. Rules by which things operate, things function. And once you are able to see these rules, you are able to see how some of these rules repeat themselves. In other words, there is a certain machzor, a certain cycle. The certain things tend to come back. Certain rules tend to appear at certain times. In the same way that we see the sun coming up every day and coming down. It's actually not the sun that's coming up and coming down. It's the rotation of the earth on its axis, right? Once, at, once every 24 hours, and once every 365 days a year around the sun, the orbit of the earth around the sun. So these are fixed, pretty much fixed. These are pretty much rules. In other words, they happen all the time based on certain rules, a certain speed of the rotation of the earth on its axis. And because of that speed, every 24 hours, we make one circle and we see once again the sun. Not every planet has a rotation of once in 24 hours. Some are slower and some are faster. Most of them are in the same way as the Earth, counterclockwise, and some are the other way around. Right? So it's very interesting that these planets, as an example, have certain rules by which they operate. And these rules, of course, have been established in the time of creation. These are rules that we don't fully understand why this planet is like this and why this planet is like that, but they are rules. And what do these rules do for us? They help us predict the future. Because rules that repeat themselves, in other words, things, phenomena, that repeats itself on a regular basis can be predicted. We can predict certain comets, as I mentioned previously, when they will reappear because they have a certain speed. We know their, their orbit or we know their direction. And based on all the instrumentation that's available to us, we can calculate. We can calculate distance, we can calculate speed, and therefore we can calculate all kinds of other things. And th that enables us to predict when that comet will be observable again from planet Earth. One of the more familiar set of rules that affects a phenomena that we're very familiar with, that is very common, is rain. Right? We have rules. These rules are being applied to all kinds of phenomena. And one of them is the weather, of which rain is a part of. And I'm not going to get into how rain happens. I think most of you approximately know that it has to do with condensation of the water on the surface of the ocean, formation of clouds, the combination of wind that brings it on the continent. And sometimes that those droplets come down. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they come down in large quantities, sometimes in less one and so forth. Sometimes it comes down as snow if it's very cold in the atmosphere. Sometimes you have a clear sky. Sometimes it's a cloudy sky. Sometimes there's some clouds. There's different kinds of clouds at different kinds of altitudes. They have different names for those of you who are interested in weather. So some weather produce, some clouds produce rain, some not. Sometimes there's thunder. And guess what? It's a full-time job today for the weatherman, right? And with the use of high-powered computers, you're able to predict. 
Sometimes predicting is easier, sometimes predicting is more difficult, depending on your location. Because they, what they do is they use satellites. They use satellites, but for those of us who are here on the West Coast, sometimes it's more difficult to know exactly what's going to happen, as opposed to those who are further inland. Because once the weather pattern has reached us, it is easier to figure out what it will do once it's inland. So for those who are further inland, for them the weather prediction will be more accurate than for those who are on the coast. They don't have weather stations in the water. So relying on, on satellites and relying on all kinds of instrumentation, it, it has gotten more reliable and, and easier to predict, but it's not 100% perfect because there's so many components so many components, and the human mind is limited in how much can they know. But they know a lot more than what they knew years ago through all their investigation, through all their research, and through the sophisticated uh, instruments that they have. So what do we see so far? That, that based on certain rules that have been developed, learned from experience, we're able to apply it to all kinds of phenomena in creation. And sometimes we're able to use it also to predict what will be in the future because these are phenomena that repeat itself, repeat themselves. Like rain, right? Weather. So we have based on the seasons, right? Which has to do a little bit with the tilt of the earth, producing a certain season, a certain climate. We're able to know, you know, what it's going to be like approximately. Then you have all kinds of disturbances in weather that do not really always follow the regular rules, but it also has certain rules of physics, and that is tornadoes, like you just had bunches of tornadoes in what they call the tornado alley. There are certain places in the world that are more prone to having this kind of weather phenomena, whether it's a hurricane or a tornado, and there's others. And even though there are certain locations that are prone, I must add something from a Jewish perspective. And that is, it's still Minashamayim. When people lose their life, when there's so much damage that's caused, it doesn't happen just because the weather decided to misbehave. It's true the weather is guided by certain rules, including a tornado. You can attempt to describe it in the language or terminology of the weather, of what it means to have a low and a high, what it means to have warm and cold air, what is it? it? You know, all the turbulence that is being generated as a result of the mixture of different kinds of air, right, can be can be explained as a very natural phenomena. But we are always supposed to believe that something as destructive as a tornado is, of course, mandated from above. It's not something that happens randomly, just like that. It's all mishamayim. Nevertheless, yes, there is something called teva. And teva is the general world, the word that we translate in English to mean nature, that consists of all of these rules that, are that we are familiar with, <clears throat> that are pretty much constant, and many, many times, many of these rules repeat themselves. So all of that is called teva. Why is it called teva in Hebrew? Teva is the, is the word that's used to mean something that is imprinted. HaKadosh Baruch Hu He imprinted the laws of nature into the world. And that is why the numerical value of Elohim, right, Elohim, which is 86, right, Aleph, Lamed, that is 31, Vav is 37, He, 42, what do we have? Aleph, Lamed is 31, then we have, I'm sorry, Hayes is 36, Yud is 46, and Mem Sofit again, 40, is 86. Right? So you have 86. What is Hateva? Hey is 5, Tet is 9, that's 14, Bet is 2, that's 16, and Ain is 70. So Elohim is equivalent in numerical, the numerical value. The, numerical equivalent of what is called gematria to hate, hateva, the nature. So even though it's teva, it's nature, it's still Elohim. 
follow me? Who made it. And as long as we don't misbehave, the Teva will follow certain rules, <coughs> certain guidelines that Hashem Hitbi'ah, He imprinted into this blueprint, into this creation. But Hashem can change it. Earthquake, of course, is explained as certain faults. In certain years, the world have more faults than others, but Hashem can cause an earthquake anywhere if He wishes to. He just uses certain faults or certain mechanisms that are more found in a particular geographical location to bring about a certain calamity for that location. He can use a volcano. He can use anything he wants. And there's a reason for all of these disasters, and that's a whole separate lecture, uh, lecture why certain things happen. What is the reason behind them? That is not always easily observable. But now we have to turn to the sources, why these things occur. But they occur because Hashem decides to occur. But He uses Teva, He uses nature, which is His creation too. His rules to, to carry out these things. The rabbis further explain that Hashem has Malachi Havala, destructive angels. And they come in the form of wildfires. That's destructive angels. And you ever wonder before an earthquake why the dogs and animals are going crazy? They have knowledge more than us about what is about to happen. They sense, they see things that we don't see. They may be seeing all these destructive angels coming down into this location. And that's what they're afraid of. They don't, they don't tell us, <laughs> right? So it's hard to know, what do you see? What's the problem? Can I help you? You want another bone? Will that make you happy? I mean, <laughs> we don't know. You have a stomach ache. Well, what is it? No. And the problem is that it's all the same across the board. All the little birds, all the little animals, somehow they sense that something is coming. So obviously there's something more than what the eye sees. But it is true that there are rules. There are rules. And what's, what's good about these rules is that it ties in to all this order and to all this design that tells us that there's a creator. I mean, otherwise, if there's no creator, how could there be rules? Just f rules of physics by themselves? It doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. It's not logical to say that. When things occur as a result of certain rules and it's predictable to an extent and it's pretty constant, that means there's some design here that is enabling this to recur, to function so beautifully, so perfectly. The sun has not decided one day not to come out, right? I mean, it may be cloudy, but everything follows the rules as they have been since creation. Then you have, of course, the laws of physics that scientists have discovered and are constantly learning about. But these are laws, these are rules, just the same as the other rules. They're pretty much constant. They can predict them, they can explain them, and how they work. Because these are rules or laws that Hashem has implanted or imprinted into creation. And you could learn about them, you can see them. And uh, at some point you can predict what something will do. <coughs> right? You drop an apple from the mountain. <coughs> and you drop a feather from the mountain. right? You want to figure out if they will fall at the same speed or not? Yeah? How did they learn about the laws of gravity? These are laws. The gravitational pull of the Earth. The gravity is different here than it is on the Moon, which they didn't know until they got to the Moon. Right? We do see, as I explained before, that as you go up in altitude, there's less oxygen. You can't run as fast, you get tired faster, and your recipe for the cake or for the halal will have to be a little bit different. There's less oxygen. So the baking time will be different. So we know about these things. We know you can't go too deep into the ocean. Right beyond 110 or 120 feet, it's very dangerous to go. You need special equipment to dive more than 120 feet. There's too much pressure. Right? Even submarines cannot go as deep as they want. They're going to explode or implode or whatever. Too much pressure. They learned these things. There's rules. 
And of course, once we're familiar with the rules, we know how to adjust or how to adapt to these rules. Certain areas of the world are colder, certain areas are hotter. This has to do with climate. And this is, of course, based on certain rules as well. So all of these rules and laws that man has discovered are common knowledge, unless, of course, uh, you don't learn about them. They're easily observable. And many of these are predictable. What happens, however, is, is there's a certain area of rules that are concealed. There are certain mechanisms in this world that are not so evident, that are not so apparent. And these are the ones that we call supernatural. Some of them are supernatural. What's the word supernatural mean? It's not natural. It's above nature. In Hebrew it's called al e Above nature. It doesn't follow the rules of nature. Not only doesn't it follow, it sometimes goes against the rules of nature. What's a typical example of something that's supernatural that goes against or breaks the rules of nature? A miracle. Ness, they call it ness. What's a ness? Ness is something supernatural. It's impossible based on what we know, based on what doctors know. How is it possible that a tumor should just disappear? A growth. It was there. They have a picture of it. But the man received a blessing. He prayed to Kadosh Baruch Hu. We've heard such stories, right? It could disappear. According to the rules of nature, that's not possible, supposedly. They haven't seen a case where, based on rules of nature, it just shrinks. Unless, of course, they applied chemotherapy and did all sorts of things through the use of medication to shrink it. But that would have to be proven. And they, don't, and they may not have a case where they can show that these things have had a, uh, the man has recovered. You know how people have been in a coma and have come out? That's also. It, it, but that they claim, well, that we have seen happen. It all depends how much damage to the brain. But at some point when there's too much damage, that they say it's almost impossible for the person to come out. And many times people have either drowned or have gone through some trauma, and they said even if he's alive, he won't be able to speak. And of course, they were proven wrong, the doctors and the scientists. Because there's a creator who decides on his own whether one will live, one will die, whether one will recover or not. It's up to him in the end. But there are statistics, I agree. And based on statistics, the statistics will follow experience of the doctors, the knowledge that they have, and they can prove it through statistics that the majority of people who have this will not make it, or if they make it, they will go through some difficulties, and it will take so much time they can even predict how much, how long it they will uh, for recovery that they will come out of it. They can predict these things why? Because they have numbers, they have statistics, they have experience. But there are times that Hashem goes against those rules that He established, and that is what we call something. Altivri, supernatural. And Ness is an example. So the mechanisms for these uh, supernatural things, of course, are concealed. We don't see them. We don't see when there will be an S, how Nisim apply, how they occur. Right? Those are concealed. Another koch in this world that is completely concealed that we don't know how it works, but we've heard about it. Not everybody believes in it. You know, there's a lot of skeptics, is Kishuf. Witchcraft. Well, the Torah speaks about it. Not only was there Kishuf in Egypt, the Khartoumim, right? Moshe made a serpent from his uh, staff, from his stick. So they also showed the same thing. And they used Kishuf. Moshe didn't use Kishuf. How did they do it? They were great in witchcraft. They were very knowledgeable in something called witchcraft. Yes, witches exist. They still do. There are places in the world where there's witchcraft. Maybe not in the same extent as it was in the past. Maybe not the exact same time, but there is these things, exist these powers. But this is concealed. These are things that we don't readily understand how it works. And the rabbis tell us in the Midrash, why is it called Kishuf? Shemakhishim pamalya shel mala. It was through the use of Kishuf. They sometimes go against Hashem's own plan of what Hashem wants there to be in this world. 
by using witchcraft they're trying to defeat that or go against it it's prohibited of course the Torah prohibits it the Torah would not prohibit something that doesn't exist something that is baloney something that is just a fairy tale so we know these things exist but it's concealed we don't see the mechanisms of how this thing can work how do you just say words or do things and you just fly in the air how? how could that be done? a man cannot fly in the air right? So, Kishuf is another example. What about angels and demons? Can you see them? Usually not, right? Sometimes, yes. But most of the time, we do not see these entities that were created, called angels or demons. They're more spiritual in nature, but they exist. So they don't follow the same rules, because if they follow the exact same rules, we would be able to see them. But obviously, they're not physical, so they don't follow the physical laws. It's more concealed. All of these things that are concealed from us are not kfufim, as we say in Hebrew, are not subjected to all those rules and laws that we're familiar with. They have a different system of rules and laws that, we're not, that we don't know about. So that cannot be learned so easily. That cannot be seen. We are just told about it. They exist. And if we're not meant to see them, we won't see them. Okay. So we've observed quite a few sets of rules that apply to nature. If we dig a little bit deeper, we will notice that in this creation of the world, everything that has been created is endowed with, has been given, possesses the tools for its survival. Now what survival means? Survival means two things. Survival means that it can protect itself, defend itself. Right, look at the porcupine. Don't try to eat one. <laughs> First of all, it's not kosher. But if you try to attack it, you know, it has all those thorns will come at you. Even lions have a hard time sometimes catching a porcupine. They get bloodied from the porcupine, from the thorns. How about a skunk? You want to smell like a skunk? <laughs> don't get too close it has a defense mechanism that it sprays right? all kinds of animals have all kinds of defense mechanisms so survival involves various things number one how it can defend itself from all kinds of dangers from the elements too a polar bear has a way of surviving the cold we cannot survive in that kind of a cold where the polar bear lives, unless you're dressed up with who knows how much clothing. Somehow, Hashem gave it what it needs to survive. And that is true with every animal in the world. Survival also means that it was given the tools to eat. Right? Did you ever look at the, the claws and the teeth of a, of a tiger? It's incredible. Such long nails, claws, such big teeth, can the canine teeth, that's what it needs to tear up the flesh of a large animal. It's not only enough to digest it, you gotta tear it up. You gotta bring it down. You gotta hold down to it. I mean otherwise it doesn't survive. You can't feed cookies and cake to a tiger. You know, we can eat all the junk in the world and somewhat survive. But these animals they need red meat a certain amount of it every day. So they need the tools to be able to catch their prey. So you have a certain setup in the ecology of nature where you have the owl that feeds on the mouse and the mouse that feels on certain insects and those insects feed on other things. There's a certain chain, a certain dependency, a certain interaction that we explained that is so perfect. Why? Because Hashem has given every one of them the tools for survival. <laughs> what else besides survival? Procreation. Just look. Isn't that interesting that everything in this world has the ability to clone itself? I call it clone itself. In other words, to reproduce itself, to make a photocopy. You know, that you take, take a human being, you can't put him in a photocopy machine and make a copy of him. But through marriage, that's what happens. Husband and wife man and a woman, male, female, of human beings and of animals, right, will reproduce. 
So here you have this complex, beautifully designed human being or animal generating or bringing forth a copy of itself for future generations to have copies too. So Hashem has given this ability, which is an incredible part of creation. Because imagine those who say evolution happened by itself. Evolution happened by itself is, of course, silly, doesn't make any sense, and impossible. But let's say something happened by itself. You think it could also reproduce itself? I mean, that's just impossible. It's just, it's just incredible. The fact that it happened, okay, let's say it happened, but now it can also reproduce itself? And just about everything in creation reproduces itself in a very similar way, where you have a male and a female. Look how plants reproduce themselves. Look how, look the kind of cooperation with the birds and with the wind, right? Of, of spreading out the pollen and having it land in the right place. I mean, Hashem created a world that can continue to reproduce itself, can continue to maintain itself. So all of this follows certain rules, but it's not only the rules, it's the ability that has been given to them to survive, to, to be able to eat and to be able to reproduce. Well, if that's the case, why don't we, the human beings, have the vision of an eagle? You know, an eagle can see from a great distance. Didn't you wish you could see like an eagle? Why don't we have the ability to fly like a bird? It would be very nice. You can fly. You can, wouldn't have problems with traffic. We don't have that ability because we don't need it. Right. If we would really need it for our survival, Hashem would give it to us. An eagle needs it. An eagle from a great distance can see a fish underneath the water. Not above the water. Underneath the water. Yeah. Just go to it and catch it. Incredible. Incredible. Not every bird can do that. Right? An eagle was given that ability to, s to smell, to see from great distances. Right? Vultures who are entrusted to clean up all the dead animals. Right? Scavengers. They see. They can detect something dead. They go up and clean it up. They need it. Right? Hashem takes care of that too. So we shouldn't have bacteria just lying around everywhere. Rot animals that are rotting around. So everyone received, every animal, every part of creation received what it needs. What, only what it needs for survival, nothing more than that. However, there are some differences between human beings. What are the differences between human beings? Some of the differences are height, color, and weight. Height, some people are seven foot, some people are five foot, some people are in between, right? Color dark, light, in between. And weight, well, 100 pounds, 200, 300, and sometimes 500. <laughs> right? They come in different shapes, in different colors, in different heights. That, yes, but they're all human, right? Where do all these differences come from? Anybody know? Now, weight comes from what you eat. <laughs> That's easy. But how about height and color? Genetics. What? Genetics? Yeah, genetics. But where did the genetics begin with? Right? You go back to the first man, you didn't have short people. You didn't have, not everybody was tall. You always had different heights. You always had different colorations. Well, what about the Chinese and the, Ch and the Japanese and the Koreans? By the way, could you tell the difference between them? Yes. You can't? Yes, I can. Yeah. Because you work with them. <laughs> Depends how they treat you. That's right. right. <laughs> That's right. That's you know. Could you tell the difference between a, far, a Persian guy who's from Isfahan and one who is from Shiraz by looking at their face? No. You can't? I could. Yeah. <laughs> Especially when they begin to talk. <laughs> Depending how much of a temper they have. <laughs> anyway. How do you tell the difference? No, there is a difference, I'm telling you. you. You put me against this wall. Somebody from Mexico, Guatemala, Costa Rica, Panama, Honduras, and Argentina, I'll tell you which one is from where. Like Just by looking at the, no, without hearing their accent. The accent, of course, if you know the accent, that gives it away. But why should their face be different? 
Anybody want to suggest? What should their face be different? So you're going to tell me, well, the guy from South America is really mixed with Italian blood. That's true. That can be true. The guy from Mexico is mixed with Indian blood. And you know there's many, many kinds of Indians. There's Aztec, there's Tarahumara, there's Zapotecos. There's all kinds of Indians in Mexico. And they look different. They look different. But that's not the answer. What's the answer? The Zohar and the Gemara says very clearly that the reason people look different from where they come from is because of the climate, because of the food they eat, because of the Adama, the earth where they're growing up. You plant a fruit tree in your backyard, mishmish, apricot, that mishmish, that apricot will not necessarily taste the same like the mishmish in Israel. Have you ever tasted oranges from Yaffa? Oranges and oranges from America? They're different. Why? Why should they be different? It's the same kind. You took the same seed and you planted it there. If it's different seeds, well, you know, different seeds. No, the same one. You planted it, it will not be exactly the same. I even detect a difference in the milk in Israel from here. But it's a cow. But the cow eats something different in Israel. Maybe they give it leaven. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, it's different. What does it have to do with it? It has to do with the geographical locations. The rabbis tell us in the Gemara, you go fishing. In Israel, you go fish in Yafo, and you go fish in, in Ahariya, or Haifa. Not too far from each other. The same fish. And what do they have it over there? They have the fish, uh, what do they call? Nesichata Nilus, and all these kind of fish. Uh, I don't remember all the names of the fish there. Right? Tilapia. Yeah, or whatever. The same fish will have a different taste depending where you caught it. The water in Yafo is not the same as the water in Haifa. You go there, what do you mean? It's, uh, this one's a little dirty, this one's a little cleaner. Water is water, no, it's not the same. So the same is true with human beings. Scandinavians will look blonde, less exposure to the sun. Some people in the dark, in the warmer climates will have curly hair. What do you think curly hair comes from? It has, now, I'm not talking about black and white right now, because black, blackness, pure blackness, is a completely different phenomenon. But to be a little bit tanned has to do with the weather, has to do with the sun. Complete black is something that is uh, another, for another time, that I, will, I can explain that. It has nothing to do with the original plan of creation. It's something completely different. You can never become completely black, no matter how many years you will live in in India or in Sudan or in Teman. But if you go to China and Japan, I guarantee it that within a generation or two, your kids will develop slanty eyes. Yeah. I guarantee it. Sure. Well, otherwise, how did they get it? Adam Marishon did not have slanty eyes. <laughs> I guarantee it. Yeah. Chava didn't have it. Abraham Avinu didn't have it. Uh, so where did it start? It has to do with where you live. That's all. And people that come from a certain country don't see it. As an outsider, I see it. I see a guy who comes from Iran, and I can tell he's from there without hearing his voice. Right? I can even tell if he's Afghani and not Iranian, because only because I've met the two and I've seen the differences. And even in the United States, the same country, there's differences between California and New York. There's even a difference between Northern and Southern California. But people don't look into these things. But if you really, really analyze that, you will notice it. You will notice the small, slight differences. There's a more, the complexion is fair when you get to the higher or colder climates. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So he's all mixed up. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it, has to, it has to do where you were born. Oh. It actually even has to do where your mother was pregnant, much more than when you were born. Yeah. So anyway, not all the scientists will agree with what I just said. Some yes, some not. It's an old argument amongst them. But we don't care what they say. We care what the Gemara says and what the Zohar says. The Gemara and Zohar says it's, 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 a, it's a fact that the feet will be flatter in certain countries the, the skull will be more oval, more square, depending on the region you were born. So that affects, if you want to know the, the small differences between human beings, that has to do with geographical location where the food people eat. Okay, but all of these are minor differences. 
besides besides the survival kit, as I call it, or the tools that were given for us to be able to procreate and to live and to just to continue being alive, man, as opposed to animals, but even animals, also on top of all the tools for our survival, we have a mission. Man has a mission, a, a tafkid. He has a purpose in of why Hashem brought him into this world. He's not in, it's not intended for him just to eat, sleep, work. That's not what we're here for. We are here for a particular, unique purpose. Each one has his individual mission. So do animals. Animals too. I just don't want to use the animals as an example because their mission is more common to all of them, to all their species. You are, you are to serve mankind, either through you as a source of food, as a source of transportation, or clothing, right? whether it's fish or birds or other animals, right? we have a list of what we can eat and what we cannot eat, but the goyim can almost eat almost anything they want. That's what animals are for. You know, they all have the more or less the same common purpose, but with human beings, each one has a unique mission and purpose uh, other than the just survival. This mission is not so evident. It's not evident when we talk about what is evident in the what appears to us, what we can see and observe, right? The mission, mutzpan, the mission is concealed within every human being at the time of birth. This mission and this unique purpose for which this human being was created or born, or came into this world, is called the mazal. This unique mission that is concealed within every human being is stamped on him at the time of birth, at the exact moment of birth when he comes out of his mother's womb. This is, happens through a system that Hashem created called Mazal. Marechet HaMazal. There's a system in place. Remember, we talked about systems before too that have laws and rules. But this one we don't see. That's one of the big differences. Right? There's a lot of things we see, we can understand and figure it out how it works. This one exists, we're told, but we don't see it. And the importance of it is especially at the time of birth. One way to look at mazal is like a wheel. A wheel, you know, there, there are wheels, all kinds of wheels. Uh, there are certain wheels where it's like, it functions like a lottery, right? You can rotate it. And depending on where it falls, you will either get two hundred dollars, five hundred dollars, nothing, right? Like a dreidel too, you know. You spin it, it may fall out on gimel. That's called that's like a form of wheel that is a mazal. In other words, depending on your mazal, you will either get this or that or that. We think it's random, but it's not random. So the mazal functions like a wheel, and it turns around every minute. It's turning. Turning, turning, turning. And depending when that individual is born, he's landing in a particular slot of that wheel. That wheel contains all kinds of mazalot, all kinds of missions and purposes in life. Depending on what moment you're born, that is where you get your mazal from. And that mazal is not just one detail, it's a whole package. In that package, there is the, your profession, your marriage, your children, your livelihood, your health, your uh, longevity, a lot of things that pertain to mazal are in that slot that the child landed on as soon as he exited the mother's womb. A system, a wheel, that is rotating all the time and depending on when you're born, that's what you get. So this has to do with what? This has to do with the mission of the individual, not just his survival, but the mission of course is related to survival, but it's more unique because it's very different from, from one individual to another. Now you understand, when Shalom Melech tells us, in the beginning of Perish Lishi, Lakol Zman Ve'et Lechol Chef Estachat HaShamayim, when he's saying Lakol Zman, that is one of the things that he implies. Everything has a time. Now first of all, he's telling us everything has a time, meaning that everything has a reason for being born at a certain time. In other words, Lakol yes man, in other words, that this man is important to it. 
that's number one. And La Kol Yezman is also telling us that everyone's man and everyone's mazal will be different. And they're all necessary. They're all necessary for this world, every single one of them. By the way, there's no, people ask about mazal tov, mazal ra, bad, good. There's no such thing as a bad mazal. Even though we may prefer one over another, they're all necessary. This wheel is all good. It's all the Hashem's creation. Why this one falls out here and why this one falls out there, we don't always know the reason for that. We don't have the explanation for everything. But that's just a fact, that it, the, the mazal will be determined at the hour of birth. Part of man's mission, which is, which is part of his mazal, is his profession. Why doesn't everybody decide to be a doctor? Why isn't everybody wanting to be a lawyer? Thank God there are not, not too many lawyers. You know, imagine everybody wanting to be a lawyer. Everybody being a butcher, a baker, a businessman. It doesn't happen. You take, you go to high school, go to high school, and you have 100 students in the class. You go to each one of them. Most of them will not know what they want to be. That's true. At some point, you know, you know better. At some point, you're not sure yet. You may want to do more things. Uh, later, depending on who you marry to, maybe you work for your father-in-law. It's so unclear. But what is your preference or what would you like to do? You're going to get a, ver a variety of opinions. This one wants to be a businessman. This one wants to, just wants to have a good job as an accountant. He doesn't have big dreams. He's good at math. He likes numbers. He wants to be a successful CPA and help a lot of people prepare their taxes. I don't know why he would want to do that, but you know, <laughs> what's so good about that? But I guess it's, it's, a, it's a form of helping people. I know. Yeah? Somebody who loves using his hands to fix things. He always fixed the bikes for everybody in his street. I don't know, he, he likes to fix. He could become a good mechanic. And they ask him, why, what, what do you want to be a mechanic for? Don't you want to make millions of dollars? He says, well, I, I love this. I want to do something I enjoy. I don't blame him. A lot of people don't do what they enjoy these days. It's whatever comes. Right? So you go through the whole class and you will see people doing, end up doing different things. Where does that come from? Where does that desire to do something different come from? Shouldn't everybody want to make something that makes a lot of money? Isn't that the American dream? Have a house and a dog? <laughs> you, know, you know, how are you going to own a house and a dog if you don't make money, right? So, especially these days. Yeah, actually, you can get a dog for free if you go to the pen. <laughs> anyway, so isn't that the dream? No, it's not the dream of everybody to make lots of money. People want to be comfortable. Why not? It all depends on their mazal. There is a mazal where a person aspires and is driven to make lots of money. He wants to be successful. He wants to be popular. There's one guy who just, all he wants to do is, is, is sports. And he's going to be good at it. He's going to be a good basketball player, good baseball player, good football player. Yeah. Pelé. You heard of the Brazilian player Pelé? Right? Where I come from? Yeah. He grew up in a poor neighborhood. He was nothing. I mean, what was he? He was nothing. He didn't have any inkling of what he will eventually be. But he knew how to play. And little by little, somehow the connections were made and elevated to incredible heights that the whole world knows about him. And he was good at what he did. Right? Mazal. It's a certain mazal. Huh? What, what a good question. What's the mission? It's called entertainment. Yeah. There's a mission called there's a mission called to entertain people. Yeah? You will entertain people. And of course, you still have your challenges within that mission of how to entertain people. Are you doing it for the money? Are you doing it for Hashem Shemaim? What are you doing it for? Are you going to get upset? Are you going to steal? Are you going to cheat, lie? But that's the mission. That's his mazal. His mazal is going to take him to the entertainment. Now, what did they do? You may ask him, what would he have done 300 years ago if he would have been born? Right? What entertainment existed then? Well, you know, they had during the Roman era, they had gladiators. <laughs> Every generation has its entertainment. Every generation and place has its sports and its. So it doesn't always have to be a soccer player. It has to be. It has to do a little bit with the times too. So what do we see so far? That there is a need for all kinds of professions, and one of the details of one's mazal is will determine what his profession will be. He is not deciding it on his own. 
It's not something just random. It has to do with his mazal. And this marechet mazalot, this system of mazalot, distributes professions according to the hour of birth. So now, that's what, wait a minute. That's a, that's a that's a very powerful statement. You mean to say that people who are born at the exact same hour, all over the world, even if it's in India or in Los Angeles, they will have the exact same profession? What's the answer to that? No, no not necessarily so. Because what did we just say with, with sports? It all depends on the time, the generation. It also depends on the country. Somebody's good mazal in Los Angeles does not exactly mean the exact same mazal as somebody in South India. There, the capabilities, because of the circumstances, are different. So he will, if he is successful here, he will be successful there on his level. You follow me? It's not that it's the exact same equivalent mazal. Because the mazal is much more complex than just a wheel. It has to do with location, it has to do with your surroundings, your parents, it has to do with schooling, it has to do with a lot of things. But a, a good mazal or a successful mazal in Los Angeles, at the same moment of birth, somebody is born in, have you ever heard of the city Ouagadougou? I don't think so. Yeah. That's Ouagadougou. Ouagadougou is the capital of the city of a country called Upper Volta, which today has a different name. But anyway, just, I wanted to throw at you a name of a place in Western Africa, right, where people were born the same hour as somebody here, would have similar masal. What is he going to make it for him over there in this place called Ivory Coast or Upper Volta or Ghana? He might be, a, he might be prime minister there. Where here, he might be the manager of a bank. <laughs> See what I mean? It all depends on the circumstances, depending on what is available there, you know, and so forth. So it's the same hour, same slot in the wheel, different locations, different circumstances. What's important, however, for us to know from this is that since this is all dependent on one's mazal, the rabbis tell us, "En adam no One will not take away what is reserved for someone else. You have two individuals who have a shoe store on the same block, same street. So one may feel bad. He's competing with me. He's taking away my parnasah. No, sir. En adam nogea b'mashemuchan lechavero. Very important part of our correct hashkafa, correct outlook. Nobody can take away from you what is due to you. It's impossible. They can't take away even one penny that is due to you. And let's say they did. Let's say they did. Somebody broke in. Somebody, I don't know, cheated you. If, if it was not meant to be as a kapara, it will come back somehow. You will make a separate deal with someone else you will buy some real estate and you will flip it and sell it and make the profit that you lost somewhere else. If what if you meant to have this year was in any way taken away, it will come back. The Torah, the Torah says when you go to court, Jewish court, you know how to go to not Jewish court, you go to a Jewish bet and the judges, the Dayanim, simply make a mistake. It can happen, they're only human. A judge, the rabbi tells En la Dayan ela masha he can only go by what he sees. What he, the, the evidence, the, the, here's the testimony. And if he makes a mistake, we're only human. He can make a mistake. The only time a judge does not make a mistake is if he truly has siyata deshmaya. The Hashem gives him the knowledge, the intuition to figure out the truth. Sometimes a, a good dayan will know who's saying the truth by, by just paying attention. Sometimes it's difficult to tell. Sometimes it's not. But not every dayan has such siyata deshmaya to always be successful in rendering the right decision. So what does the Torah say to us? Don't worry. You go to Bethany if you need to. That's the only recourse you have. But what about if there may be a mistake? How could there be a mistake? Well, false witnesses. Two witnesses come and say, we saw him lending money to him. And you say, might be talking. You know, I never lent him money. Oh, I should the other way. Lending money is not a problem. You know, one says I paid him back, and I have witnesses. You have witnesses? They were never there. I never got your money. 
whatever. There's always kind, always, always these kinds of of issues and problems where people deny, people say, people even bring witnesses. False witnesses, what do you do then? The Dayanim have to go by what the witnesses say. The Torah tells them, listen. The Torah adds this clause. Don't worry about the outcome, because even though the outcome is completely wrong, they're mistaken. The real Mishpat belongs to the He's going to give you back the money later on. If you don't deserve to lose that money, it's going to come back to you. Hashem is the one that runs this world. If people make a mistake, then he has to give it back to you somehow. Why did he allow mistakes to happen? He has his reasons why he allowed it to happen. Maybe he's testing you. You're going to get upset. Let's see what you're going to do now. Maybe it's all a big test for you. We don't know. But as far as the money, if it's meant for you, you're going to receive it. If it's not meant for you, then why be upset about it? The one, of course, who takes it illegally is committing a big sin, but that's a separate story. So the rabbis tell us, therefore, because of the way the mazal works and because of what has been decreed from above, nobody can just interfere with that. So you don't have to lose any night's sleep about the fact that somebody's competing with you. It won't help him anyway. As I told you when we spoke about bitachon, a person who has true trust in Hashem will go over to his competition and say, you know what, if you need any help, I'm there for you. How's that? Who's going to do that? <laughs> Only one who has complete bitachon in Hashem says, he can't take away my business. He can't. How about a guy who used to work for someone, the guy gave him a job, he just came from Israel, right? Found him a place to rent. And this employee, after a number of years, instead of being grateful, was ungrateful. He went and opened up his own place, and now he has the whole customer list. And he has, he knows what to buy. What about that? Is he going to take away this guy? He's going to shut him down. Forget about the fact that he's ungrateful. And it's questionable whether he can do that. Don't worry about it. Because what, what will Hashem do? Hashem says, you know what? I have various choices, Hashem can say. I can either make it that this guy will fail miserably. He will make one mistake and they'll get so upset at him that they will shut him down. I can make it that he will be, they will be audit him and he will come crashing down. Or Hashem can do it in another way. You know what? Yaakov, he took away your business. I'm going to put, plant it into your mind that right now it's time to open up another business. And he's going to do very well or even better in that other business. There's so many ways that Hashem can balance things out. If you have a Munayim Bitachon Hashem, that's what you're supposed to believe. Nobody will hurt you. Nobody will take anything away that is due to you. It's impossible. Okay. Even though this system called Mazal is also built on rules, it functions based on certain rules, right? The hour of birth and so forth. It's not completely revealed to us. We don't understand the mechanisms of how it works. What we do know is that many, many, many parts of this mazal are predestined. So when we talk about predestination, what are we saying? We're saying that things nikve'u merosh, they have been already established from the very beginning. When did we say that beginning was? The time of birth. It's really at the time of conception, but let's call it the time of birth. The time of conception is just a plan. It's, 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 the plan is set, and the time of birth is what actually makes it happen. These things that are, that are determined from the very, very start is not only in the profession. We're talking about many, many such details. As we said before, all kinds of details of a person's life are governed by this moment of birth. What is the common denominator that ties all of these details together? There is, a, there is a kav, as I call it, a, a, like a string, you know, a string that ties all the pearls together. I think there's a special name for that string. Uh, maybe you would know. What do you call the string, the thread that ties all the pearls and all the little pieces of jewelry together? Right? You open it up and they all fall off. So this thread that is holding all the details. No, no. This thread that is holding all the details of the mazal is called kivun. Kivun means direction. This is very, very important because there's a certain GPS 
that is implanted into every one of us that gives direction. And you know what happens when you have this kivun, this mechanism that is automatically sending you in a particular direction? You can't move away. You can't change course. They have cars today, by the way, if you don't know about it. They do have already cars that are automatic. They don't need a driver. They maintain a safe distance. It's programmed. They maintain a safe distance. They will brake or speed up depending on what the radar reads from the car in front of it. Yeah, what if the computer breaks down? That's what we have insurance agencies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they have to pay sometimes. What can we do? But you can read the paper, you can read a sefer, you can whatever you want to sit in the back seat and not worry about it. This will help traffic because, you know, some people don't know how to drive. They drive slow. They, they, they just don't know how to drive. So this eventually they'll come up with this. They already have planes that are taking off and landing on their own. Wow. So, so the technology has been around for a while, but to actually implement it on the road is not, they're, they're, they don't want to do it just yet. But the point of this is that once you have this kind of a program, you can't just decide to move out. Thank God, Baruch Hashem, that in some freeways there are these barriers. You know what would happen if you wouldn't have these barriers? The cars would go into the lane on the other side that is coming in the opposite direction. It has happened anyway. Because of the speed of the car, it flipped over on the other side. But barriers serve as a, a mechanism to guard us from falling over the cliff or from going into the wrong lane. So the mazal, this kivun, this, this direction portion of the mazal, keeps us in a certain path. You cannot really deviate, even if you wanted to. What, what that means, very briefly, is that if one is intended to go in a particular way, do a particular job or profession, uh, live a certain kind of a life, uh, have problems at certain stages of his life, certain illnesses at, other, as an, at another stage, this is all kivun, this is all the derech, meet with certain people, right? He will not be able to move away from this. This is what will happen to him regardless. And this is what the Zohar and the Gemara say, Ragloi de bar inash inun arvinle latar de mitbain tamam avilin yote. One's feet, in Aramaic, one's feet are his co-signers, his guarantors. They will take him to wherever they belong. If you belong right now in Mississippi, right? For whatever reason, you have to be in Mississippi now, then somehow, some idea will enter your head to go to Mississippi, you will open up, I don't know, Craigslist, right? <laughs> and see, oh, this is a great deal, right? And you will go there and you'll catch the next flight. You think you thought about it? It just came to your mind, just out of the blue? It's part of the general kivun. You get up one morning and you want to go to work. You usually take the 405. That morning you decided to take a 101, right? You think you decided on your own to take the 101? There's a certain kivun. Had you taken the 405 Haz Shalom, you would have been involved in a car accident. But Hashem says it's not meant for you to be involved in a car accident. That's not in your kivun. It's not in your kivun. You're going to go on the 101 today. You, we don't realize it, but it happens all the time. Because of this kivun, the general direction of that mazal, things are adjusted all the time. Okay? Now, what's not adjusted is, I want to have chocolate ice cream instead of vanilla ice cream this morning. I mean, that's a preference. I'm not talking about these kind of things. But let's say that ice cream is going to give you an upset stomach. Let's say it's contaminated, and you're going to get sick from it, and it's not meant for you to get sick from it. It's going to fall on the floor, and you won't eat it. Or you won't buy it at the last minute. You'll buy popcorn instead. I don't know. right? Because it's not meant for you to get sick from it. Now, we're not talking about smoking and alcohol where people get sick because they want to get sick. <laughs> right? That's different, right? I'm talking about something that was not meant to happen to him. He was not meant to, to, to drink this poison. So, what happened? Hashem put Mordechai next to Bigtan Vateresh to overhear their conversation. They want to assassinate the Hashverosh. Right? Can they assassinate him? Of course they can. Will Hashem allow it? No. How is Hashem going to stop it? They can get a heart attack. Somebody can overhear their conversation, right? 
or something else. There's so many ways to stop something that is not meant to happen. There's a kivun. What's the kivun? Achashverosh has to be the king now. But he's not qualified. Neither is the president of this country. <laughs> right? How did he get there? Nobody predicted it. And we still don't understand it, but Hashem wanted it. That's the only explanation. Nobody will get that position, presidency, leader of a country, unless Hashem agreed to it. How, how can he do it? How, it doesn't make sense. It still doesn't make sense. I don't believe it. Well, Hashem wants it. There's a reason for it. You see, that's kivun. That's not only that man's kivun. He could have been a CA, CA, C, CEO. 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 Yeah, of some kind, of some big company, because he has a good mazal. Whatever. To be a president of the United States, it's complete hashgacha, complete divine intervention here, of who it will be. Him, such a young age, no experience at least running a country. I'm not saying that he's that he's totally not fit, but it does. He's not what we would call a, a, a qualified president that understands the needs and can act on his own. And he really doesn't make all the decisions, by the way. If you, if you have any doubts, he shouldn't get the credit for what happened now in, Afga in Pakistan. He didn't do it. It's the people who are in the defense, the people who are in the intelligence. They are the ones who discovered. They are the ones who took care of it. They get the credit, not him. I don't understand why he's getting the credit. Just because he made an announcement, he gave a speech, I did it, we did it. <laughs> that's, that's, so what? So what? It's not him. But that's the way that people think. Okay, he's the president, he gets the credit. It's not supposed to get the credit. But anyway, it's all Minashamayim. All of this is Minashamayim, what's supposed to happen. He was caught, not caught. I had a dream 10 years ago, after the September 11th, that he was going to get killed. It was six months later, a year later, I don't remember what it was. Approximately then. Okay, so I figured, okay, it's a, it's a wait and see game. Sooner or later it's going to happen. Huh? Ali Khalom. So, so what? So what's the big deal? Sooner or later. Anyway, everything's in Hashemayim. The fact that he did what he did, the fact that he was caught, that's all. There, everything's in Hashemayim. It's not a matter of good or bad. It's, the important thing is that it's in Hashemayim. That's what matters here. It's all in Hashemayim. So this direction is a very important concept because it reminds us that there is a Borela Olam, there's a creator, there's a creator who created this world for a purpose because we see that this world functions based on rules and some of these rules are known in advance. That means that he has a purpose for all this. Otherwise, why would he set these rules and want things to have this kind of an outcome? Right? And for, for these rules to be carried out, there has to be a plan. And the question is, of course, how do we get to this plan, to this takhli, to this ultimate purpose? But there is a purpose. The only question is, how do we get there? So this mechanism called kivun leads us there. If we have a mission and there is a plan, the only question is, how do we get there? How do we fulfill it? How do we carry it out? Leave it to him. He sets the kivun because we don't know on our own how to get there. Now that we understand that there is a general kivun direction, we will understand what we will read next week about all the various opposites. Wealth and poverty, right? Oshavoni, pain and peace, peacefulness, wisdom and foolishness, right? Two opposites, life and death, or birth, love and hatred, the building and destruction, war and peace, all of these opposites, guess what? They're not always up to us. All of these extremes, all of these opposites, all of these things that Shlomo Melech is going to speak about, if they happen, which one happens does not completely depend on us. There's war. It doesn't necessarily depend on us. Right? In, in Rosh Hashanah, some have the custom of reading the following prayer in Untane Tokif, especially the Ashkenazim. And what do we read there? That this year will be determined who will have a peaceful year, who will be in pain, who will die, and from what he will die. All of these things are determined. Now, why are we reading it in Rosh Hashanah? Because since we are going through a day of judgment, there are certain things that are decided at that time. Even though there is a mazal that has been destined from the time of birth, 
as I'm going to I'm going to explain soon, the Jewish people have it slightly different. We have a, a special relationship with Hakadosh Baruch Hu where we can modify that mazal. So during the day of judgment, certain decisions are being made. Does things remain the status quo like the mazal, or are they changed for the better or for the worse? So Rosh Hashanah is a very important day where things can be modified somewhat. All right, besides the fate, not faith, fate of an individual or of a country, by the way, which also has a mazal, what else depends on one's mazal? Which we'll just briefly touch on, one's personality and character. I've spoken at length about this and you, there's a lot of lectures and information that you can look up in EnglishTorahTapes.com and at TorahOr.org if you want to see the video about mazalot, astrology, that deals with the, also the personality of the individuals. But I just briefly want to tell you that this moment of birth determines that too, in part. One's personality and individuality because it consists of the four elements of earth, water, fire, and air. And the various combinations of these things that people have at the time of birth. That will determine to a great extent their personality and that in, to a great extent explains relationships of why some people are attracted to some people and others that they can't even stand to see, to look at. They, you know, they, they, they just don't, don't get along with them. So the reason or the explanation for why certain people get along better, the compatibility levels, has to do with the, the mazal, the mazalot of them as well. So mazal is not only a system of predetermining one's fate, one's goral, one's life, it also has a little bit to do with, uh, with giving an influence over a person's personality besides the genes and besides other factors that contribute to, to that too. But that's, that's a very interesting area in itself of why people behave in a certain way. It, many times it has a lot to do with the moment of birth, which explains why their personality and individuality, their likes and dislikes, are the way they are. Okay. Then we have, of course, the soulmate. The soulmate of one is a very, very important part of one's life. She or he will be your partner. And of course you want that individual to be the best one. You think you can make that decision? You think you can choose who you want? No way in the world. How are you going to know? You don't know anything about a person until you live with them for 35 years. And then maybe a little bit. 35, not less. <laughs> yeah? Even then I'm not so sure. Yeah, I'm still learning. Yeah. Yeah. So how are you going to decide who to marry? Baruch Hashem, you don't get to make that decision. He does for you. Because he knows which neshama goes with which neshama. It's, it's a, we're talking about souls, not just a physical body. Short, tall, fat, skinny, blue eyes, brown eyes. We're talking about neshamot. Who he, which neshama goes with which neshama? Leave it to him. As long as you do what you're supposed to do. Right? You behave yourself and you're not too picky, and you, and you go searching for him, and you demonstrate a willingness, a desire to get married, to settle down, there's no reason not to believe that you're not going to get married. He wants us to get married more than we do. He wants us to have children, to have families. You don't think he wants it for us? Just don't, don't bother him. <laughs> don't interfere with his job, and things will work out. You see, if that's the case that Hashem gets involved in Zivugim, then what's the mazal all about? The mazal will determine how difficult it will be, when it will happen, how it will happen, at what age it will happen. The actual union of the two people, he determines. Only he knows who goes together. When and how, what difficulties, what hardships. Are the in-laws going to fight? I don't want a big wedding, I want a small wedding. No, I'm Persian, I have to have a big wedding. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I want flowers. Oh, no, no, that can cause a lot of problems, as you know very well. That is all part of the mazal. That, of course, you, be, you have to be careful with, right? Are you going to have hardships or difficulties? People have broken up because of the silly things. Oh, you're only going to be a dentist? That's it? That's not good enough for me. What kind of a car do you drive? Only a BMW? <laughs> 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 I mean, you know, people have all kinds of shtuyot in their head. These things break up good marriages sometimes, and that's terrible. But anyway, a lot of it depends on one's mazal. If one has a good mazal, everything goes smooth. If one has some hardships and obstacles for some reason that we don't know, then that's part of the mazal. 
Once you introduce the concept of Gilgul, of reincarnation, then that particular package called Bazan has an additional component called Tikkun. That when he goes through his life of 70, 80, or 90 years, certain things will happen that are adjustments for a previous lifetime. You're going to lose $25,000 at the age of 42. And who's going to take that money away from you? The guy that you took money from him in the previous lifetime. You follow me? That's going to happen at 42. Why not? Why at 42 and not at 25? Because you don't have the money at 25. You'll have it at 42. <laughs> but whatever. Or it could be after your kids got married. Why should they suffer? They don't deserve the pain of, lo of the father losing money. So Hashem has to do it at a certain time when only he suffers, not them. You're going to get sick at the age of 61, not earlier. Why? Because your kids don't deserve to see a sick father. They need a healthy father to raise them. Or you want. You see what I mean? So Hashem has to make everything just right at the right time, especially if there's a tikkun for a previous Gilgul that they don't deserve. You see, only He knows how to do it. Anyway, now I have some news for you. Because all of this mazal is following certain set rules, and it's so perfect, and it's from the very beginning, from the first day of the moment of birth, it's actually imprinted in a person's hand. Look at your hands and you will see lines. Sirtutim. What do you think those lines is? A baby does not do this all the time. So don't blame the baby for closing <laughs> his fists. So these lines are not from picking up bricks. Look at a baby the moment it comes out of the mother's womb. The first second, he's still crying. The umbilical cord is still connected. And you see lines. There's a lifeline. There's a heart line. There's a headline. There's a fate line. There's a marriage line. There's all these lines that the majority of the world does not know what they mean. Okay, apparently Hashem does not want everybody to know everything about it. But Pasuk in Iyov says clearly, In everybody's hand it's imprinted to know all his deeds, what he will do in life, what will come from him, everything is there. Now don't go running to the gypsy tomorrow. Okay? Don't go running to the gypsy to read your hand. First of all, she's going to charge you money for it. Right? She's not necessarily going to tell you all the truth. Number three, her hashkafot or her interpretation of things may not be the same as what we interpret. Number four, many of these goyim use impure forces, emtsaim lok sherim, means that are not kosher to reveal the future. That you have to be very careful with. Tamim tiyem Hashem elokecha, you have to trust in Hashem. But at times, these things are very valuable because they help see the problem, the source of a problem in a marriage. Who's at fault, he or she or both? Maybe there's a problem here. Maybe he's a liar. Imagine a guy coming to get a job, and the guy who's going to employ him knows how to read the hand. I'm sorry, I can't trust you. He doesn't have to tell me the reason, but anyway, right? Today they use polygraphs. They use hand analysis, which is more psychological to figure out a person's personality. There are various ways to know people. And it's all in the hand. It's very clear. You can see in the guy's hand if he's going to be in prison and for how long. You can see if he will be a widow, Hazbe Shalom. You can see when he's going to become sick and from what? From the head, from the heart. And if it's from the heart, you can warn him not to, be, not to drink too much vodka. Or not to do, everything is there. Why is everything there? Because what did we say before? Why is Teva called Teva? Hashem hitbi'ah et chotamo. Hashem is imprinting this world, this creation, with his seal. In the same way, he imprinted man with the seal of his fate, of his mazal. That is why everything is there from the beginning. Just want to finish up that there are many stories, many stories of how Mazal works. The Mazal is real. Not to forget, however, that we have the free will to make certain changes. Besides the fear of heaven, everything is up to us. What does fear of heaven mean? Mitzvot and Masim to good deeds. It's not part of your Mazal that you get angry and you hit someone that you choose to do. So kol bidei shamayim, everything is in the hands of the heaven as far as parasa and children, marriage and, and health and so forth. But there are certain areas, a limited area, called yirat shamayim, where our behavior is being tested. Life, if we succeed in life or we fail in life has to do with that area. If you make a million dollars or you made only ten dollars, that depends on your mazal. They can't, they will not complain to you. Rega Adoni, why didn't you make a million dollars? You could have. They don't care about that, because that's your mazal. 
they will care about how you acted, how you behave, how you spoke to your spouse and to, and to other people, how much tzedakah you did, how much chesed. That depends on our khirah of shit free will. That's not mazal. Mazal can give you netiyot, inclinations, but how, but how much you do or how much you don't do, it's up to you. You want to pray, you don't want to pray. You want to help, you don't want to help. You want to be nice, you don't want to be nice. That all depends on your free will. That area is free will. How much you smoke is also free will because it's not healthy to smoke, right? Everything else is mazal. Yirat shamayim is not mazal. And that is why a person always has to reevaluate his situation and say to himself, wait a minute, am I doing the right thing or the wrong thing? Because it could be that this is up to him. There are certain things that are not up to him. Oh no, why did I marry her? You know, people have asked me, Rabbi, can you tell me if I made a mistake? Did I marry my soulmate or not? Maybe I made a mistake. Should I marry someone else? So are you willing to remarry the same woman if you were given a second chance? If the answer is yes, it usually is the soulmate or the one that was intended. If it says no way in the world, <laughs> I would never, then that could be questionable. Don't worry about these things so much. Reevaluate your behavior. Should I have done that? Not have done that. Should I have said that? Not have said it. Because that is completely up to you. That you have control. Am Yisrael me ala mazal. And with this we'll finish. Don't forget that the Jewish nation is above mazal, meaning that we can change it. We don't always want to change it because maybe that's our tikkun. Shuvat filat tzedakah mavrim et roa gezerah. Repentance. Prayer and charity have the ability to uproot, to tear up decrees and to change the mazal. There are stories of people who were only supposed to live to 45 and Hashem gave them an additional lease of life for 20 years. People who were supposed to die because of cancer, they be recovered through the blessing of a big tzaddik, through the power of prayer and tzedakah. What do we say Tehillim for if not to be able to change sometimes the mazal? Should we try? Of course we should try because maybe that's what Hashem wants of us. Hashem made Sarah Rivkara Hevila according to their mazal not being able to have kids. Why? He wants them to pray. He gives you everything, you're not going to pray to him. So sometimes all he wants from you is to pray to him. He's going to give it to you. Ask of me. Pray to me. Remember that it comes from me. Don't take it for granted. So Am Yisrael Baruch Hashem is blessed that we have the ability to approach HaKadosh Baruch to beseech him and to ask him and to beg him. And of course by changing our Ma'asim to change our Mazal. People who still have a problem with Mazal, I would point you to look at the Eben Ezra. Eben Ezra was a big astrologer. He was so poor, he had a terrible Mazal, and he knew all about astrology. And he said, if I would have a, a factory of candles, it will always be light. It would never be dark. If I had a factory of tachrichim, of shrouds, people would stop dying. In other words, no matter what I did, I would not succeed. He was in, a, in order to describe his bad Mazal, he says, if your mazal is not good, no matter what you do, it's not going to help. So what, what should you do? You pray. You pray. And if it's meant to be, of course, that Hashem will change your mazal, then people who have not had kids for 25 years, after 25 years they had a child. And sometimes after <coughs> adopting a child, they had a child, because they did this chesed, this maaseto. We don't know. We have to try everything. <coughs> There's a lot of stories. I don't, I don't think, we don't really have the time just to prove that uh, there is such a thing as mazal. <coughs> Many, many stories. Maybe another time I'll talk about them. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a fact. It's a fact of life, and you can even see when children are playing Monopoly. People, kids playing. If there's one child who wins more than everybody else, he will have good mazal when he's older too. Because the mazal melave otcha, it will accompany you wherever you go. At all times. There are people who have good mazal, bad mazal, good, bad, throughout their life. And there are some who's always going up or always down. There's different kinds of mazalot. It's, uh, it's very difficult to get into all the examples of all kinds of mazalot. Anyway, a person should not give up hope. A person should always remember that even if he, he has any difficulties, turn to the one who gave the mazal and ask him to improve it at least. And that can happen. Just to finish up, Human beings, as much as their Baruch Hashem have a good structure and they have this kivun in, the, in them, they don't always know what to do. That's a fact of life. We don't always know to, the right thing to do. Should we do this? Should we do that? Because of this, HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave us, HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave us the mitzvot. The, the purpose of the mitzvot, of the commandments, 
It's for what reason? Not just to reward us, not only for Olam Abba. The purpose of Mitzvot is to direct us. We, don't, we can't really direct ourselves so well. The Mitzvot help direct us. And if we follow the Mitzvot properly, we will be able to maximize our true potential. If we maximize our true potential, Hashem, then we will have fulfilled our mission. Thank you.